of Raptors Weekly Holiday Edition. And uh, the Raptors have just beaten the Denver Nuggets last night in Denver uh, to go to 24-7. and They beat the Nuggets 116-102. And uh, making his podcast debut for the year and for the season is Blake Murphy. Hey. What's hey, going what's going on? Long time. Yeah, yeah, I've been a little bit. You guys record these on Sunday nights when I'm unavailable. Except this one. This one's, yeah, nice Monday morning. Good way to start the week. Yeah, so so last night's game, Blake, let, let's talk about this for a second. 116-102 win in Denver. Going into this game, man, this is like a setup for a loss. All the excuses are ready to go, back-to-back, on the road, thin air, that tough game the night before against the Clippers, uh, without DeMar DeRozan, tied game in the fourth quarter, but the Raptors somehow, they somehow pull it out, man, against all odds. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting there watching the fourth quarter. I expect them to lose because all the excuses, as I said, are there, but somehow they just managed to pop out a win. It's unreal, man. I continue to have these little bouts of like small amounts of pessimism, not like the sky is falling or anything, but like, hey, they should probably lose this game or, you know, they might be this is a bad trend. They might go on a, a little skid here. And every single time I'm wrong, they're just, and, and remember at the start of the season too, I was the most pessimistic with a 47 win projection. And now I look like an idiot. Um, they might get that in February. <laughs> yeah. This team, uh, I don't know, man, they just keep doing it. it. There's not a lot of explanation for how they keep playing this well. Yeah. The bench obviously is something to talk about, right? I mean, last night, Lou Will with 31 points and Vasquez struggled, but Williams made up for that. Uh, anytime they go to the bench, uh, just positive things happen every time. And the criticism is that a lot of the offense there is uh, not very organized. It's more like gunning one-on-one play. Do you have an issue with that? Like th- that's the, that's the part that tells me this bubble might burst because the way Williams is playing, the way Vasquez is playing sometimes when he's hot, is that sustainable long-term? Because that's the major complaint that I see from pessimists who say the rapper's record isn't real is that those two guys the production especially of williams is so high that it's bound to tail off yeah I, I, it probably is um that doesn't mean it's not happening right now and it doesn't mean that these wins don't count like yeah lou williams is not i mean this is right now the these are the best numbers of his career like he's averaging 15 points which would be a career high he's shooting, what, 38% on threes, which would be, I think, a career high. Um, PER, career high. True shooting percentage, career high. Like, these are career highs across the board. And guys generally don't have career years at age 28, two years after an ACL injury. But even if, like, I mean, he doesn't have to be this good, right? This has been kind of a luxury. If he's somewhere between this and the Lou Williams of last year, I think that would still be just fine as your top scorer off the bench. Like if he's averaging 11 or 12 points a game and you know, his PR slips from 21 down to into like the 16 range, which is reasonable. I think that's fine. Um, it is a little scary if you look at his playoff numbers from Philly and Atlanta, but obviously you worry about that when you get to it. Um, and that's on the coach and the other teammates to occasionally take the ball out of his hands if he's cold and getting a little shot happy. But for the most part so far, he, He's been all good. Yeah, absolutely. As, l- last night, he hit some shots. Uh, and the thing about his shots is that you know they're coming. You know exactly what he's going to do on the court. Uh, you know he's going to go left after that move. You know he's going to pull up and try to draw the foul. But the defense can't seem to stop it, even though he's been in the league for a long, long time. His, the scouting report should be out on him, but maybe <laughs> maybe he's missed some time. Last year, people just forgot about how good he was. Yeah, or like, yeah, not being able to stop his drive and that little move to his left, I understand. The continued foul on his weird little pump fake is what gets me. Like, like, like how he continues to get fouled on these long twos and threes. He's. I saw a stat earlier in the year. I don't know where to find it for an update, but him and Lowry were both among the league leaders in fouls on shots, like far, far from the basket. It's it's crazy how much guys bite on this. He's already like he's he comes off the bench and he's averaging seven free throws a game. Yeah, it's insane. It's insane. It's awesome. And the other guy, we don't want to focus on Williams uh, all the time, but we got to talk about Terrence Ross a little bit, who I've been impressed with uh, over the last, uh, since DeMar DeRozan went down, he had a couple of rough games, but since then he's picked up. And like what I've noticed is that uh, like he's handling a lot of the ball more. 
he's driving a lot more. Sometimes the results aren't there, but the process is correct. Uh, even last night in Denver, he took it to the rim multiple times, had a couple of dishes off for dunks. But there's a change in his game where he's kind of assumed more responsibility in the absence of DeRozan. And it's not necessarily just scoring because um, you don't expect him to carry the scoring load with DeRozan out because we have guys who can do that, Williams and, uh, and Lowry. But Ross has added that extra dimension of versatility where he's doing the little things on the floor. And that that's something really positive that I find uh, from Ross's game, who so far has just been considered just a shooter. But over the last six, seven games, he, he's shown that he can be a, a lot more. Definitely. Eight rebounds against Denver, the game the bigs were struggling. Williams actually rebounded really well, too, as did Lowry. Um, but eight boards for Terrence Ross, seven on the defensive end when the other guys weren't getting it done. Um, you mentioned the drive and dish. He had one beautiful, beautiful drive, I think going to his left and just like dropped one off for, I think it was an easy Lowry layup. Yeah. It was just, there continue to be these little signs with him. I, I tweeted on Sunday that like there are all these pieces and the puzzles still not there, but like you, you've got the full set of pieces at this point. We need to figure out why he is so afraid of contact though. Mm. In the last seven games, he's taken four free throw attempts to 90 field goal attempts. How much of that is his role, though? Like, is, is, you think his role of a three-point shooter affects his ability to drive, or is he, is he genuinely afraid of contact? Well, I mean, you, you mentioned that he's driving more, but, like, his free throw rate is criminally low. It's, it's I think I said in the post game he has the eighth lowest free throw rate of all qualified players in terms of, like, free throws per possession used. So, like, this isn't just, hey, he's a spot-up three-point shooter, so he's not getting fouled. This is like he's among the lowest fouled players in all basketball. It could be that he hasn't yet really gotten the respect of the officials because he drives so infrequently that people are now starting to realize that, hey, this is a guy that drives and might generate contract. And officials think like that. So maybe if he continues doing this over the course of, say, two, three months, he might finally get that call and get the whistle and, and get to the line. Because DeMar DeRozan needs to drive a lot even in year one and year two, but not get to the free throw line just because the reputation wasn't there. And Ross's reputation is so much as a three-point shooter right now that it might affect when he actually does drive. Yeah, I mean, that's got to be the hope, right, yeah. is that as he gets more comfortable driving, he gets more aggressive, and as he begins to drive more, the refs give him more calls. Um, DeRozan only really had his rookie year, though, where he didn't get those calls. Like, he was averaging five free throw attempts a game by his sophomore season, and Ross is averaging one still here in year three. Like, I don't know. At this point, I think it's a fair it's fair to criticize him for his inability to get mm -hmm. to the line. Maybe, maybe not, like, to the degree of being the worst in the league, but, like, it's clearly something that's missing from his repertoire. And until he starts, mm -hmm. you know, these drives are getting better, and his vision out of these drives is really encouraging. But he's got to find a way to draw that contact as well because that's a huge part of driving. And it's something the Raptors are really missing with DeRozan out. Their free throw numbers are down in general. And while the offense hasn't been – hurt much that you know free throws help your defense too. right get your defense set and stuff especially on back-to-backs it helps slow the game down you don't have to run as much so it definitely helps but again the offense coming from the bench more than makes up for some of the deficiencies of the of the starting unit and and, and let's talk about vasquez for a second here do we have him well yeah, yeah let's talk about him because i think he's getting a lot of um a lot of hate. Even the top comment and the quick reaction is just uh, is going at Vasquez. Um, oh, you should see one of the top comments in the uh, the post game right now. It, it like just went up, so there aren't a lot of comments yet. But what is it? Uh, J James Johnson is Jordan esque driving. <laughs> Which Jordan? I think, it was, I think it was serious. Yeah. And, uh, he had a. Another miserable game yesterday, and people are starting to hate on his floaters. And um, like the way I look at Vasquez is that um, once you accept that he's going to take three or four really bad shots in a game, like they're really going to be really bad shots. They're going to be of the pull-up variety, no rebounders underneath. They're just going to be bad shots. Once you accept that, he's much easier to digest because more often than not, he does provide some sort of punch off the bench. Maybe not of the Lou Williams variety, but definitely a punch. We saw that in, in, in the Clipper game. Without Vasquez, we likely lose that game. So I don't have an issue with his hot and cold nature because I do find that more often than not, he provides value. It's just that when he looks bad, he looks really bad, and it just clouds everything else. Yeah, like he, like no matter how good you play off the bench, you shoot one for ten, that's what people are going to notice. And like the shot selection, I think he had three shots like deep in the paint like deep out from the basket in the paint where they were like those little push shot floaters that ha didn't go in um he bricked a really ugly long too early 
But like you said, he, he still brings something. He had six assists. He had no turnovers or only one turnover. It's fine. It was a really bad game, but he's not as mm. – you know, he hasn't been quite as bad as 38% shooting would suggest. Mm. Uh, and you would think that the threes are going to eventually fall. He's hitting 31%, but he's a 34% career shooter. Um, you would think those are eventually going to fall. And Yeah, I don't know. I guess, his, uh, I guess his struggles are highlighted even more by Lou Williams playing so well because they're kind of thought of in the same vein as our – our main guys off the bench, but you know, it's been 31 games, but it hasn't been 82. And I think he'll, I think he'll end up closer to where he's the, the line he's established in his career hmm. than the line he's currently at. So before we get to the Clipper game, one final point, we got to talk about Tyler Hansford last night, 20 minutes, uh, five for eight field goal, a huge, huge influence off the bench. Uh, I've noticed, and I made a comment on one of the articles is that his offensive game seems to be more developed, not not refined where his one-on-one offense is good suddenly, but he just seems to know where to go when you have ball handlers on the court. Like with Vasquez on the floor, with Williams on the floor, he knows when to slide to the rim, how, how to create space or, or get out of the way when his guards want to shoot. He's got that element of intelligence on offense that I haven't seen in the, in, in the last couple of years. But this year, man, he's a, he's a different player. Well, getting out of the way was the big thing in the fourth quarter on Sunday. Just just get the hell out of the way. He played 11 minutes, and I don't think he touched the ball except for one rebound. He's had a really tough season, and Sunday was the best he's looked in a long time. Like I, I think maybe the Oklahoma City game early in the year was the only game you could point to this year where in where he played better. But he's pretty much fallen out of the rotation a little bit, and hopefully Sunday kickstarts him a little bit. But I, thought, I think you're right. I thought he played well. I thought he did a good job. So not spacing to the three-point line, but but moving well and being in the right place at the right time, and that helped open up space for the guards. He's a terrific screen setter. So for Lowry and Lou in that fourth quarter last night, um, that was really important. I was impressed. I thought he played well. I thought it was the best he's played pretty much all season. Yeah, and especially for a guy who's getting uh, inconsistent minutes, 25 minutes one game, 11 the next, 8 the other, then 3. Uh, he, he's managed to handle himself well, uh, I think behave well. Uh, I think his on-court demeanor is great. And when he does come on the court, he produces. Uh, like when you look at his numbers in terms of rebounding and shooting, he, he's a productive member off the bench when he does come on. Granted, against the Clippers, he just came on and was a bystander for the most part. But when you talk about the Raptors trying to make a move at the deadline and you look at who we could possibly move, his name invariably comes up because he's not really part of the tight rotation. He could be expendable, but at the same time, I don't. I think he's all right. That's the thing. You, you'd only part with him if you're getting a more capable exactly. backup center back. You wouldn't move him for you know help on the wing or something like that because he is probably when it gets down to it in the playoffs. I mean, Amir's probably the backup center in a playoff rotation, but Hansbro, they're going to lean on Hansbro before they lean on Chuck Hayes in most matchups. Mm-hmm. So. Um, unless you're upgrading that spot, yeah, I don't think he's going anywhere. No. Did you watch the Clippers game? I did. I was at work, um, so it's kind of one of those things where a lot of things are going on, and I can't watch it play by play, mm-hmm. and I didn't have time to rewatch it yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd say I caught probably two thirds of two yeah. thirds while I was working. Yeah. So same thing again, much like Denver, tight game in the fourth on the road, and in those situations, the advantage always goes to the home team. Uh, but again, the Raptors just pull and the it team off, with man. Superstars and the team with, the, with, with three superstars. You might you might argue with uh, with Griffin, Paul, and and I don't know I don't and know how you rank uh, and DeAndre Jordan. He don't made an impression. They played thirteen guys in that game. Uh, so so Vasquez here comes up and scores eight quick points in the fourth quarter, and boom, you get a ten point cushion, and the Raptors kind of cruise home. What I noticed in this game was the defense on uh, on Chris Paul. A lot of different looks, whether it be James Johnson, and we even saw Terrence Ross guard uh, uh, Chris Paul in this game for, for, for stretches. Just solid defense on Chris Paul, not allowing him to get all the way to the rim. They, they cut him off at the paint. He had to pass to uh, uh, Crawford. He had to pass to Barnes, those guys who couldn't really make the plays. Just good game planning by Casey for not allowing Paul to run rampant. Yeah, I'd agree with you. And I, I love James Johnson getting looks on point guards. It was one of the things that, you know, that was one of the things when they signed him this offseason. Hey, he can guard four positions. And it sounds like the general, like, training camp smoke, they blow up guys' asses. But he legitimately can guard four positions. And especially with Lowry not playing his best defensive basketball so far this year, at least not in, like, a man-to-man sense, it's important to have Johnson who can do that. And, you know, if Ross can do that, consistently he hasn't yet but like it was nice it was encouraging to see him to do it for a quick look but because the guard rotation with DeRozan out and Lowry a little slower on the defensive end um, 
Yeah, there, we're, our perimeter defense isn't great right now. So James Johnson being able to step up and, and slow a guy like Chris Paul down was fantastic. And it's not just his uh, defense. Cause we talked about all season that uh, he's also bringing the offense as well because uh, that's something may, you may not have expected from him at training camp. You thought he was just a D guy. But, for example, if he's against a smaller guy, he will never take a bad shot. He'll always back him down. Whereas if he's guarding a bigger, he'll uh, like a big, he's going to he's gonna try to lull them and drive on them. It's just that kind of intelligence that, that he's brought that I, I certainly didn't expect. Yeah, the only the only complaint I have with his offensive game really, I like I like his driving ability. I like um, he's he he tries to be a little too fancy maybe sometimes passing, but his vision is generally good and he tries to make the right play. God, if the dude could hit a corner three pointer, nineteen percent from three on the season, he's six for thirty one, and he's only twenty five percent for his career. That's man, that's such a. That's, that's okay when he's playing with Patterson because you can kind of invert the offense and post John, James Johnson up while Patterson sits in that corner. But when he's out there with, say, a DeRozan or something, that's uh, it can get a little clogged up. But, hey, when you're shooting 58% overall and 67% on twos. Maybe it's a blessing in disguise, man. You know, maybe he can shoot the three so he won't take the three and, and, and he'll stick driving to the rim. So I'll he's look still, at that He's way. still taking more than one a game. But Which is all right. It's not too that's bad. That's fine. Yeah, they're, they're probably – if you look at it, they're probably very open looks that yeah. he has to take. I don't recall him forcing anything this year. Yeah. Would just be nice if he could knock him down, that's all. It's funny because uh, when I look at Terrence Ross's line, I find I personally like his game over the last four games where he shot poorly than when he's like 6 of 10 and just shooting wide open threes. It's, well, yeah, it's mean, just odd to me. Four game sample, you're... You're gonna. You gotta look at process over results. You gotta. You gotta look at how those shots are coming. And you know he's developing that little push shot when he drives. They ran. I, I don't know how much they did this against the Clippers, but against the Nuggets on Sunday, they ran a few of DeRozan's pin down plays for him. And you know he was missing the shots, but doing a good job getting open. And he, he appears to be learning to move better without the ball. Yeah, unsightly shooting percentage over the last seven, but whatever. He's putting himself in a position. He's shooting 35% over the last seven games. But if you looked at all those shots individually and were like, okay, well, maybe he shoots, you know, 40, 42 percent on those normally, then that's a really good stretch of ball. And, you know, hopefully this pays off. Hopefully those start dropping. He gets a little more confident. And then when DeRozan's back, they've got another weapon. So th this game kind of annoyed me. You know why? Because I was watching this game with my uh, I was on the couch watching this game and my wife was like next to me. She's reading a book or something. And uh, I'm like, you what know, a nerd. I, <laughs> I'm like, um, can you name me three Raptor players? Because you live in a house with a guy who watches a shit ton of Raptors, writes about it, does podcasts. Surely you must take enough interest in me to to say, give me three Raptor players. And she looked around, she goes, uh... And you know what she says? TJ Ford. Wow. I'm like, that's not even in this decade. That's a, that's a way back. That's way back, man. That's the last time she paid attention to the TV while it was on. 2008. That's when TJ Ford was last on the team. 2008, that's right. All right, man, let's take a quick break and we'll come back and talk about the Bulls game and um, and also some Landry Fields. All right, welcome back to Raptors Weekly. So the only blemish in the week was the loss to the Chicago Bulls, 129-120, a very high-scoring game uh, in Chicago. Uh, the Raptors, after they lost this one, had lost four of five against Cleveland and Chicago, the two uh, projected top teams in the East. So after this game, Blake, did you kind of think that eh, they 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 got to they got to start winning these games, or else the record might look a little a uh, little hollow? No. Nope. It's fine. They lost by nine on the road to the best team in the Eastern Conference. This is not a big deal. Yeah. The fourth quarter was really frustrating. Those 49 points Chicago hung, kind of embarrassing. Like, it's the most in franchise history in a quarter, and it's the most the, the, the Bulls have ever scored in their franchise history in a quarter. And it was frustrating, but, you know, you lost by nine on the road to the best team in the Eastern Conference. And as much as people may have, you know, maybe getting carried away with the 24-7 and seven record, and yeah, it's awesome, and this Raptor team's at least slightly better than I thought to start the season. The Bulls are still better. Cleveland eventually, when they settle in, is probably still better. The Varejo injury hurts, and God, they played like complete garbage against Detroit on Sunday. But yeah, it doesn't it doesn't raise anything for me. It would have been nice to take that other one at home on national television, the one Rose got hurt in and they almost came back late. You know, I've always thought the Bulls were a better team, and it would have been nice to prove something in this game and like steal a win or whatever, but... It doesn't doesn't move the needle for me because if I looked before the season or even before this week, 
a road game in Chicago. That's a that's a loss to me. Uh, so uh, I was watching the open gym. They had the camera on Dwayne Casey after they had lost that game you mentioned uh, to the Bulls at home, and uh, he mentioned that this is the type of game that we're going to have to have to win. And he gave the example of if if they face the Bulls at the Eastern Conference Finals, that uh, the, the game doesn't make our season or doesn't break our season, but this is the type of basketball where we have to excel at and win eventually if you want to progress deep into the playoffs. And he specifically gave the example of, of the Eastern Conference Finals. So just looking ahead now, if the Raptors take care of their first round matchup and say come up against the Bulls, like what do you think right now is deficient on the Raptors? Like what is the area that they need to improve on to match up better with a team like Chicago? Let's leave Cleveland out of it right now because they're still a bit of an unknown, especially with the, with the injury you mentioned. But just against the Bulls, like what is the one area the Raptors really struggle at or need to improve if they want to if they want to handle the Bulls over a seven game series? Just basketball, man. The Bulls are just a better team. I mean, like the Bulls, for my money, are the best team in the Eastern Conference and probably a title favorite. It's not negative to say that the Raptors just aren't there yet. And, you know, the Bulls are better at a lot of positions. Like Kyle Lowry is awesome. Derrick Rose is getting back to being Derrick Rose. Jimmy Butler has locked up DeRozan, I think, every single time they've ever matched up. Mm -hmm. uh, the Noah Gasol, Gibson, Miritich frontcourt is just so much deeper than what the Raptors can throw out there. Uh, and Tom Thibodeau is a really good coach. So like right now, I think the Bulls are ninth in defense and mm -hmm. that is like embarrassing for them, but they're sixth in offense. And, and for, for as long as I can remember, it's been their offense that was, you know, in that 10 to 15 range while their defense was one or two. So when they get things nailed down on defense, if Derrick Rose keeps playing like he's played, this team's just really good. I'm not sure what, tactical adjustments you make if you're the Raptors over a seven game series that the talent doesn't win out with and, and Thibodeau can't can't counter well for me when I, when I look at the Bulls I, I see Paul Gasol just basically eating up the Raptors when it counts uh, underneath uh, no matter yeah. who they put on him and uh, when uh, when Noah decides to play when he's like in that aggressive mode he's very difficult to stop and to me that aligns with the Raptors weakness which is the the weak center position nothing against Valanciunas he's been fabulous this week great offensive player uh, at least great offensive uh, player for this week at least I just think that that's one area where the Raptors really need to strengthen rebounding and interior defense and you can't shut down everybody on the Bulls as you said Jimmy Butler Derrick Rose but what you can do is you can slow down guys like Paul Gasol who you've seen in the past are able to be slowed down if you put the proper big on them but again that that's something for Messiah to do at the deadline hopefully strengthen that interior center position and, and, and maybe they, they, they have a chance against the Bulls because right now I'm with you man I don't see is beating this team forget seven game series or even over a five game series we can't beat them unless we make some adjustments uh, on the on the roster they didn't even do that job that bad a job on the bigs like none of the bigs had a particularly great game um the raptors only got out rebounded by four overall which is not bad against the bulls um but it's more than just like keeping them off the the score sheet because you know a guy like amir johnson if he's tasked with guarding Pau gasol because valanciunas has noah or vice versa you know, that takes him, that puts him moving around and it takes him away from the rim as the help defender. And then when a guy like Derrick Rose or Jimmy Butler gets cooking, there's no one back there because, you know, the bigs can't leave Gasol and Noah. So it puts, you know, it's pressure on the big guys to defend those guys well and keep them off the glass. And then it puts additional pressure on, on the perimeter defenders because your backline help just can't be there as quickly and as much. So... And just when you're tired uh, dealing with Derrick Rose and Pau Gasol and, uh, and, and Noah, what they do is they throw in the X factor of Todd Gibson off the bench, who is just one solid player who just backs you down, very physical. And I saw Patrick Patterson guard him, and he did a commendable job, but Gibson's just so good in the post and face-up situations that they become extremely hard to stop on, uh, on, on defense because of who they bring off the bench. And Aaron Brooks is like better than DJ Augustine was for them last year, so they've improved their offense to a degree where the Raptors just, just can't handle him right now yeah and, and the the thing with gibson too is i mean he's solid offensively and he, he hits the glass and everything you mentioned D, on the defensive end he kills your pick and roll mm. he's so agile and, and quick moving around the court and like w without the raptors having you know a back to the basket power forward or even really i mean patterson's a spacer but like they're they're not going to they can switch someone onto him to watch him in the corner like gibson Gibson makes it tough to run your offense because he snuffs up the pick and roll pretty well. You mentioned DJ Augustine. This has nothing to do with anything. He's been really bad again for the Pistons. Um, I think that was a Bulls thing last year. I, I know some people kind of like wrung their hands when the Raptors 
cut him and then he was awesome for the Bulls. I think that's a Bulls thing, man. Aaron Brooks is playing really good. They're getting a lot out of Etwan Moore now off their bench, uh, and DJ Augustin's back to sucking. I, it, Thibodeau just has something with third-string point guards, I think. To be fair to DJ Augustin, who, who in Detroit isn't sucking? That's true. Although, hey, you beat the Cavs, man. <laughs> Stomp the Cavs, really. It was... Sunshine, dog's ass have once in a while. Uh, yep. so let's talk about Landry Fields for a second. Uh, Checking your Twitter account, you had a bit of an issue with... Uh, uh, with Fields actually practicing on the weekend but failing a concussion test on Monday. So just tell me about that. Okay. Well, I mean, everyone saw the highlight by now, I'm sure, right? Yeah, uh, where he tried to, uh, where he got faked out of his pants and just went head over heels. Yes, and his head's bleeding and he goes to the locker room. I get it. I, I want to be very clear. I don't think the Raptors have done anything wrong here. They appear to have followed the protocol that the NBA has set out and they have a, a really, the Raptors have a quality training staff and medical staff. I don't think they, I doubt that there was anything, but you know, the, the best care given to given the fields. My issue is more with the protocol and the way concussions are handled in general in basketball. I, I remember one time last year, I forget the game, but Lowry took that like knee to the head mm -hmm. and was able to stay in the game, which, and he looked loopy. Um, you know, for, for a guy like Fields, that was a really serious fall and a really scary one. And yeah, he passed the concussion testing protocol after the game. Maybe it would have been a good idea to sit him out as a precaution and practice on Saturday. He practiced and then started failing the concussion protocol. And, you know, the Raptors, again, they're, they're not in the wrong. He passed the, pro he passed the testing. It's the process of dealing with concussions that, that, that maybe needs to be looked at. Right, because a lot of times the symptoms are delayed onset. You obviously can't say something like, oh, if a guy gets hit in the head, he has to sit out a week no matter what. But, like, th there's got to be some way to tweak the protocol where there's a middle ground where, you know, what if Fields had taken another shot to the head in practice on Saturday? And then Sunday he's he's got concussion symptoms and, like, he did further damage to that concussion. Um, I don't know what the solution is because I'm not a doctor and – you know, do you wait two days? Do you wait three days? Is there some gray area in the in the baseline testing or something like that? But like, I don't know. It's just scary to me, man, that a guy could take a fall like that, practice the next day, and then later they're like, oh yeah, now now we see a concussion. Unfortunate for him because he had just come into the rotation as a starter and was producing very well, especially on defense and bringing his intelligence, uh, you know, in, into the Raptors four. He finally got off the bench and was a productive member of a unit, which had to feel good. And now he's back on the sidelines. Yeah, I thought it, that's the that's the unfortunate part is that he was playing pretty damn well. You hope this doesn't cost him his rotation spot, but if the injury lingers and then DeRozan's almost back, it's conceivable that he could be mm -hmm. back at the end of the bench. You know, James Johnson's played well while he's been down, and then there's far there are far fewer wing minutes when DeRozan's back. But you know, his his playing well again was a good story. That's not that's not that much of a concern so much as you know this guy now has his egg scrambled and who knows how long he's going to be out. I don't know, man. Concussions just scare the shit out of me. I've had a bunch of them, and I know how frustrating they can be and how scary they are. And just, I don't know, man. Landry's a good dude, and he's he's dealt with a lot of things that keep coming up in his career. And it it's really shitty that he finally was getting some run, and then another thing pops up. like Because so the Landry Fields uh, resurgence articles was all over the internet. I, told, I, I said it at the start of the year, man. Landry Fields' comeback season. This is... And I think Matt Schantz uh, took out an article on that as well. So uh, yeah, he didn't realize that I have exclusive domain. Yeah, on Fields articles. <laughs> at Raptors Republic, we'll, but uh, we'll talk to him about that. Yeah. Uh, did you get to see any Bruno in uh, in D League? Yeah, I watched it. Uh, I watched it late Saturday night. Oh, nice. What did you uh, What did you make of Bruno? I thought he was more or less exactly what he's been when we've seen him in summer league preseason and and his brief NBA stint. He's really long, and that causes disruptions on defense. His IQ obviously isn't there yet because he's played like, I don't know, 200 minutes of organized basketball. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's crazy when you think, when you think of it that way, right? That, that, yeah. That's probably what he's played, 200 minutes of like actual basketball. And he, here he is in the NBA, which is – I don't know how many people you can say that for. But he's the youngest player in the NBA. His length defensively – like he can stand on a guy in a corner, help on the drive if it's on – if he's on the strong side of the floor and – easily get back out to cover the guy in the corner so he's like defensively 
the potential is there for sure, just based on his length. And like, if his instincts get better and his defensive IQ creeps up, you know, there's there's a lot to be excited about there. Like, what do you think will happen over the course of time? And uh, so, so if you haven't. Um... I uh, haven't seen Bruno play in summer league. Uh, he was 5 for 14 in his first game, had seven rebounds, took a lot of shots, a lot of uh, bit of a me ball type shot, but that's what happens in D-League. Uh, a lot of plays kind of whittle down to one-on-one play, so uh, he, he did a little bit of that. He had a couple of threes. He had one three, actually, had some nice drives. But with the game on the line, he was asked to uh, inbound the ball, uh, presumably because the coach uh, valued his length and maybe he could see over the defense. But unfortunately, he made a bounce pass, a low bounce pass, uh, which was picked off and uh, and taken for a dunk on the break and, and, and his team lost the game. And, and he looked uh, pretty distraught when the camera panned on him uh, after that play. But overall, you know, he got 20 minutes and that's he's gotten 20 minutes all year with the Raptors and he got that in one game with the Mad Ants. So like, if, if you want to look at it from a development perspective, it's great news. Yeah, and I think the Fort Wayne stint is going to be short. I think he'll come back to the team once he'll go back to the team once they're off this road trip and they can begin working with him again at home. I don't know. I, I've been beating the D League drum for a couple years now that like I really, really wish this year of all years the Raptors had an exclusive affiliate mm-hmm. because they share the the Fort Wayne Mad Ants with I think twelve other teams. Oh yeah. That's so a lot. he's he's down there. There are, you know, anywhere from eight to ten NBA mouths to feed who might be assigned. The the coaches don't belong to the Raptors. The training staff doesn't belong to the Raptors. Um, I don't know if maybe they send a player development coach down with them to work with them or what. But like, you know, he's just he's just there, and and the Raptors don't have a whole lot of control over it. Fort Wayne has every incentive to do right by him because they want to keep strong relationships with these NBA teams. But if they had an exclusive affiliate, you would be able to do this kind of stuff all the time. Give him 25, 30 minutes, run plays for him. Um, have him execute certain things that you want him to execute. The one change in the CBA this year is that you can send uh, you can send a player down as many times as you like, which wasn't the yeah. case in the past. So that that helps the Raptors as well because they might send him three times alone in this season and three times again next year, and that 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 wasn't possible uh, under the old rule. So 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 right. that that, that and, that's and for they can keep sending him forever if they want. There's no more only in your first two seasons thing. Before Wayne has three more three more home games all before the Raptors come home. So Bruno should get into three more games, I think, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Um, I would expect him to get called back up after that because the Raptors have that little three-day break. Yeah, I'd expect him to get called back up then. And, you know, you know, you debrief with him about, about what he's done. And then you can, at, at least then when he's sitting on the bench and practicing and, and stuff like that, the the training staff has actual video to go over with them. They are, they're not just working on fundamental skills and stuff like that. They'll have, they'll be able to break down actual game tape, which will be nice for them. Good point. So if you haven't seen Bruno highlights, check Raptors Republic. Uh, there's an article on the page, w- which has links to uh, his made field goals, uh, the highlights from the game and, and actually the full game. So, so do check it out. Uh, we'll take a quick break and, and come back and preview the, the rest of the week's schedule. Welcome back to part three of Raptors Weekly. Uh, looking ahead to the week's games, uh, three games this week. Uh, we got uh, Portland on Tuesday night, and then we got Golden State on Friday, and we finish off the, the West Coast swing with Phoenix on Sunday. Uh, let's talk about Portland first. Uh, big point guard matchup here again, Lillard versus Lowry. Uh, it reminds me a little of the Clippers game where you're going up against a really good team who's stacked at pretty much... Uh, uh, you know, a lot of positions and the Raptors will have to overcome a lot of odds. Again, one of those games that you expect them to lose, but hey, man, you just never know these days. Yeah, and Portland's missing Robin Lopez. LaMarcus Aldridge has been in and out of the lineup with an illness. You'd expect him to be good by Tuesday, but he sat out again Sunday. You know, you might run into this team a little banged up. Um, Nick Batum's playing through a sprained wrist, I think. I don't know if that's fully healed yet, but he's been playing. So yeah, you might be running in this team at exactly the right time. Their offense, their offense last year was beautiful. I think everyone got behind how effective it was. You get the mid-range maestro of Marcus Aldridge and then a ton of three-point shooters and then Dame Lillard who as much as clutch doesn't statistically exist, clutch certainly exists for Damian Lillard. Uh and this year they figured it out on defense too. They rank as the number 3 defense right now, which I don't think is sustainable especially with Robin Lopez out. But they've got some really quality wing defenders. They protect the rim well. 
This is a tough team. I'm hoping Aldridge actually plays because I, I want the Raptors to get tested against uh, against a solid team, uh, and and I want to see how Amir Johnson um, handles Aldridge and how Valanciunas handles him. I think I want this road trip to be as much of a test as possible, and I hope they're they're full strength for this one because I want to see a good game. Uh, Lillard versus Lowry excites me just because uh, neither of them back down. And as you said, and once in the fourth quarter, we know what Lowry can do. And Lillard's been doing that over the last couple of years. So uh, very excited to see this game. I'm actually writing the post-game report for it. Couldn't be happier. Can't wait for it. Sweet. Yeah, it should be, should be good. It's going to be a really good test. The, the Blazers move the ball a lot, hit a lot of threes. It's a good test for the Raptors defensively. Portland's defense is really good. It would be a bigger concern, I think, if DeRozan was playing just because Nick Batum could theoretically shut him down. With the Raptors not getting a ton of scoring from their wings, it'll be interesting to see what Portland does. Batum's probably going to guard Williams or Vasquez, whoever the second whoever the second guard on the floor is, if Batum plays. So mm. that'll be uh, that'll be really tough. He's very long and a very good defender. So And hey, uh, calling on Jonas, because with Robin Lopez out, they've been starting Joel Freeland and Thomas Robinson uh, and giving Chris Kamen 20-25 minutes. So opportunity here. Jonas has faced a lot of tough, tough interior defenders lately with Chicago, the Clippers and Denver. So opportunity here for Jonas to, you know, you kind of it's kind of like taking the uh, the weight off the bat from the on deck circle. He's had some decent games against the Clippers. Even they had DeAndre Jordan guarding him. Uh, Jordan got 20 rebounds, but, uh, you know, uh, Valanciunas got his as well. And uh, his, his finishing around the rim has improved. So, so looking forward to that. Yeah, now with with the matchup easier, it's just like you know, it's taking that taking that ankle weight off. You should be able to jump a little higher. So. Can he jump? Can Jonas jump? Yeah, I mean he can jump enough to dunk at seven feet. Yeah. Yeah, he barely jumps. That's about it, though. Yeah. So after that, we got Golden State Warriors, who uh, who have lost two of three. Uh, they they dropped both games at the Staples Center to the Lakers and the. Um, and the Clippers, I saw the Clipper game, and they were, again, tight in the fourth, but then the Clippers just went on like a 14-2 run and put the game away early in the fourth, and then they beat uh, Minnesota. They blew them out at home, and uh, they're going to play the, the Sixers on uh, on December 30th before facing the Raptors on January 2nd. Uh, remember last year this game? I think the Raptors had, what, like a 30-point lead, and they blew it? Yeah. You know how good I was saying Portland is? Mm -hmm. Golden State's even better. Number five in offense, number one in defense. Um, Bo gets out. Which, you know, that's a, a kind of a minor positive for the one game. But again, similar to what you just said with Portland, you kind of you kind of want that test, right? Especially if you if you work under the not assumption, but the uh, the idea that this is maybe a loss, you'd obviously rather face a full squad Warriors team then. So it's a true test. Mm -hmm. um, but Bogut's out. Azeli is uh, banged up, so they might be thin inside too. Though they do have they they have David Lee back now. Man. Raptors fans who haven't seen Golden State play, I guarantee are going to come away from this in love with Draymond Green. He's such a, like, Raptor fan kind of player. Surprising three-point shooter. Did not expect that from him. Like, yeah. he, he has that tendency, kind of like Vasquez, but at the at the small forward or power forward spot, where he'll just pull up in transition, receive the ball from Kerry, and just drain that three. And and when he takes that three, you're like, as an as an opposing fan, you're like, yeah, take that shot. It's a horrible shot. But then he drills it with, with stunning accuracy, and you're like, what the fuck? Yeah, we got to worry about this guy now? 34% on the season, yeah. and he's... Uh, you know, when they put him in the starting lineup with David Lee out, everyone was like, yeah, well, their defense will be way, way better. This this is good. Yeah, he's averaging 12 points, too, uh, in only 33 minutes, and he doesn't get a lot of touches. He gets those 12 points, you know, within the flow of the offense. He's got a low usage rate, below average. He's a really nice third piece in that starting lineup. Yeah. Like, you got Steph and Clay, and then he can do that. Obviously, Bo gets their anchor defensively, and Harrison Barnes is, is you know, whatever you think of Harrison Barnes at the three. Um, he's actually been, I shouldn't talk like that. He's been pretty solid this year compared to last year. Who would you take, Harrison, Harrison Barnes or Terrence Cross at this point in their careers? Yeah, that's really tough. Probably Harrison Barnes still by a hair. Mm -hmm. Not a, you could convince me either way. I watch Terrence Ross every game, right? And I don't see every minute of Harrison Barnes. So the frustrating things that Harrison Barnes probably does are not, uh, they don't stick out as much to me. Former Raptor, former Raptor Leandro Barbosa's on the, on the Warriors, who, who, who's a fitting player for that team, right? There you go. Holler at your boy, Bruno. <laughs> won't, he, won't even get to meet up, but yeah. you know maybe we'll see the Bebe Barbosa hug. They're good though, man. Their their rotation from the one to the four is really solid. With Bogut and Azeli both out, obviously they're super thin inside. But man, you bring Igudala and Livingston and David Lee and Mo Spates all off the bench. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, they're a good team, man. They're a good yeah. team. And um. Well, what what I like about them is is Clay Thompson. Who, if you ever thought that Clay Thompson was a just a just a shooter, 
like watching over the last two years how he's evolved into this complete player on offense where he has so many different moves is phenomenal because when he came into the league i really thought he was going to be kind of like a and kill me for this man like a jason capono type i'll just shoot the three but his growth as a, as an offensive player over the last two years i don't know if i've seen a guy at that position get so good so fast yeah, in, in the last 10 years he's really good man yeah. you don't you don't average 21 points and three dimes just shooting and like you know, it'd be nice if he passed a little more and could create for others a little more, but he just doesn't need to do that on this team. The only, probably the only thing that you could suggest that they do a little bit more is stagger Curry and Thompson, just so the second unit's offense holds up a little bit. It might not be an issue now that Lee's back, but their offense drops by 17 points per 100 possessions when Curry hits the bench, even with thompson out there still just, just keep in mind the raptors were up 30 against this team last year before they promptly blew it we'll see how it goes again with the raptors you just never know they might just pull this out so keep fingers yeah. crossed weird thing about the raptors is they are they're basically blowout proof right what's their biggest loss of the year nine points uh yeah i i think uh the bulls Fourth game kind of turned into a blowout in the third quarter but they kind of pulled it back towards the end and, and made it respectable yeah. they only have one double digit loss the entire season that 14 point loss to cleveland so as much as, you know, you look at this, the Raptors are probably going to be seven or eight point underdogs. Yeah, I don't know. They'll keep it tight. I'm sure it'll be a good game. And to uh, round off the week, we got the Phoenix Suns. Uh, poor Tyler Ennis not getting any run. I'm very disappointed in that. Yeah, well, when you're the fourth or fifth point guard down the depth chart. <laughs> Corey Joseph's getting some run in San Antonio now. So maybe that came with like three years after being drafted. So maybe it's just Corey, a matter of time. Corey Joseph, for... Corey Joseph is legitimately good yeah. now. Like he was, he was a serious project when they drafted him, and maybe even a reach at the end of the first round. And like, didn't play at all the first two years. Spent most of his time in Austin. He's been really. He's not Tony Parker, obviously, and it hurts the Spurs when Parker sits. But like, his numbers are solid. He looks really good out there. He's become a pretty decent defender. Mm. Corey Joseph's legit, man. So, so maybe there's hope for Tyler Ennis that you just gotta be patient, and maybe in year two or three you might get your run here. Uh, but Phoenix, I haven't seen much of Phoenix, so just just because they're in a weird time zone, and I can never like catch the start of their game. So, just the highlights here. Like, what do you uh, what do you see in Phoenix that threatens us other than uh, Bledsoe and the uh, Morris brothers? They're still figuring out. I mean, last year Bledsoe Dragic as a pairing was awesome. They signed Isaiah Thomas, which some people thought was curious. They have this three point guard rotation now. They're still figuring it out. Bloodstone and Rodgers are still solid together. Thomas's on-off court stuff is really strong. It looks still like Bloodstone and Rodgers are having some trouble, especially Drogic, figuring out how to play, how best to play with Isaiah Thomas, because Isaiah Thomas always has the ball in his hands and is one of, you know, the league's heaviest dribblers per possession and stuff like that. So they're still adjusting, and they miss Channing Fry a little bit, as good as Markeith Morris has been. Markeith Morris is only hitting 29% from three, which is, you know. They need him to be in that mid-30s range that he was at earlier in his career. Marcus Morris has actually stepped up as a, as a pretty good three-point shooter, but they're they're missing Channing Fry a fair amount. Alex Allen and Miles Plumley have both been up and down at the center spot. Like they both have good shooting percentages, but don't really they haven't really done much other than that. I was going to point to uh, Alex Len as as a guy who's getting some minutes of late, uh, and uh, he's done uh, really well for them. And again, a European center, which uh, Jonas Valanciunas tends to uh, get up for. So I look forward to that. Like Len has been playing. He's he's been he's on my fantasy team, and he's been just phenomenal over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I, I don't think he shot under fifty percent over the last uh, couple of weeks, and uh, uh, his scoring's high, rebounding's high. He had eleven rebounds against Sacramento, eight against the Lakers. So he he, uh, he should pose a challenge to uh, to Valanciunas, who who tends to get up for these kind of matchup so look forward to that yeah len is uh i mean he was kind of a forgotten dude entering the season he was the number five pick last year and then missed half the season with an injury and barely ever played yeah he's played encouragingly he's still only 21 he's 7 1 255 so he's a huge dude he's still making you know the the mistakes that rookie centers make especially defensively and stuff and he doesn't have the best hands um this is a, it's a good matchup for Jonas, especially now that Len's starting. I hope you're right. I hope he's up for it. He appeared to be up for Jusuf Nurkic on Sunday, elbowing him in the head. <laughs> if, he, if this game had come up a week and a half ago, I would have thought it was a for sure win based on how the Suns were playing. But they turned a six-game losing streak into a six-game winning streak mm -hmm. now and look a little more like last year's Suns. This would be a good test. Really good test for the defense. And just to, just to give the listener a taste on who they've beaten, they've beaten Washington on the road, Dallas at home, they beat Sacramento on the road. Uh, so some good wins in there uh, you know, on, on their six-game swing. Yeah, five, so, uh, five of those six wins were on the road. Yeah. And they've got, they've got two more road games. 
uh, before they, they head back home. God damn, look at this schedule that they're on. 11 of 14 on the road. I believe uh, they, they played Philadelphia uh, on the first game back from their long road trip, and they, and they played the Raptors right after. So you know, and they always say that the, the first couple of games uh, coming back from a road trip are always going to be a little testy, so maybe the Raptors can lean on that. But well, again, the crazy part is that right after the Raptors, they go on another four-game swing. Man, it would be nice if the Sixers could help the Raptors out this week, eh? Because Golden State and Phoenix both play Philly right before Toronto. You know, maybe maybe don't get rolled by 40 points in each of those games so those teams can't rest all their guys. <laughs> Neither is a back-to-back -back situation for Golden State or Phoenix, but still. All right, so l let's get to predictions before you round off. So, uh, Blake, let's start with you. Um, well, you know me, man. I'm the most pessimistic Raptor fan on Twitter. I'm going to say one and two. One and two? Yeah, I'm going to say they, they drop Portland and Golden State and then end the trip off well against Phoenix. I'll go with two and one. I say win Portland. Lost Golden State, win Phoenix. I'm being I'm being optimistic here. Yeah, it was split hair. E either way, both of us are predicting that mm -hmm. they finish this five game West Coast swing with a winning record. Yeah, um, or, or, or 500, which is fantastic. Yeah, I don't I don't like looking at this six game. This is a six game trip. They played the Bulls in Chicago, but then they had four days off, and then they went on this five game West Coast trip. It's a five game trip to me. Whatever, however you slice Sem it. Semantics, yeah. yeah. All right, so that's that. Uh, Blake, man, thanks for coming on. Uh, we'll try to do more daytime recording so you can uh, be on the podcast. More. It's convenient for everyone, right? Except Will. Will prefer yeah, to Yeah, well, Will. where is Will right now? He's, He's in Vegas. Somewhere. He's in Vegas. He's in Vegas. All yeah. grown up. His birthday, was, uh, his birthday was last week, eh? Oh, was it? Yeah, oh, nice. Happy birthday. He's 23 years old. Holy no, no, no. His, the, the 23rd. I think he's actually only 22. Oh, fuck. That Maybe is... only 21. I have no idea. No. All right. Hey, Happy birthday, Will. And uh, that wraps up the pod. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks, Blake.